Uh, it, it, okay, so I, uh, I think, yes, sir. Uh, I think I'll, I'll get started. People are still finding their places, but uh, for the sake of time being. So, so yeah, uh, you all might know me by now, or I hope you have seen me. Uh, uh, I'm Danilo. I, just to give you a little bit of context, I'm a big uh, complexity enthusiast, so it's not by coincidence that I'm here. I've been on and off working with complexity labs for two years or so. Uh, and me being here is just an extension of that uh, relationship. And one thing that really gets me about complexity or really uh, resonates deeply within me is uh, emergence. Uh, so I think it's maybe a concept or a phenomenon, I like to call it like that, that you are familiar with. Um, well, there are many ways to describe it, but the visual way that I like is the flock of birds. And not by chance, uh, I have this t-shirt which my mom made, which I'm very proud of. So yeah, uh, when Josh invited me to come and well, help organizing, but also speak about something, um, I wonder, well, what should I talk about? Uh, what do I have to share with all of these people who are, well, so well versed into complexity and all that? Uh, and so that began the process. And it is this process that I'm going to share with you. Um, and it's something that I like to look at as an experiment, as an experiment really, which has its own ontology and epistemology. And I think I can use those words here, so I'll go with them. But let's start from the beginning. And just this is just a um, so the, the uh, yeah the, the the image I've chosen. I, does anybody get the reference here? Yeah, uh, Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship of the Ring. Uh, I feel like the process I'm going to describe to you. Um, it, it looks a lot like that, so that's why I took that, that picture. Uh, and the subtitle, or, or yeah, of the, of the talk is uh, In Search of Gateways to Emerging Phenomena. And I hope I'll make myself uh, understandable <laughs> uh, by the end of it. So let's get started. Um, so just to give you a little more context about myself, um, this is kind of like what I've been doing for the past two or three years. And I really, I've been really all over the place uh, in terms of my activities. I'm not associated with any institution nowadays. I do a little bit of stuff that we can call consulting, I guess. But most of my stuff is, uh, again, detached from organizations. Um, and you may ask, well, how do you leave? Well, I, uh, on the one hand, I was lucky to get into the whole blockchain uh, early. So that gave me a bit of freedom to... Well, just do whatever I want to. Uh, not whatever I want to, but I have more degrees of freedom. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, I really don't have, um, yeah, I, I don't do well with institutions. Uh, and that's, I think, the reason why I left the two universities I started. Uh, and after I left the second one, that's what's when I got connected to Complexity Labs. And then, well, all these sort of things emerge in terms of projects, places I've been in, that I've been exploring. Uh, just so to, so to give you a context of, which I think is important to what's to come, about um, myself. And for all that, I like to say that I take an approach into complexity, which is um, a lead approach. Uh, I do like the theory. I do like uh, the tools that people usually describe when talking about complexity. But I really do think that um, to really, well, have a grasp of it, an embodied knowledge, you have to leave it. And for me, a big part of that is um, leaving complexity, uh, again, not through the lenses of one organization or not through the lenses of one institution, but rather through the multidimensional lenses of my interactions with my peers. So for that, I think the peer-to-peer -peer framework is something that resonates a lot with me. So that's a bit, a bit about myself. There's a lot of stuff to unpack here, but that's not the focus of this talk. Oh, this is rather small, isn't it? Uh, can, can you read it? Well, I'll read it for you. I'm sorry, I wasn't expecting uh, such a big uh, screen. I think you can fix that. Yeah, uh, maybe if I zoom it. Oh, man. All these high tech people in the room, I love it. All right, so here we go. I'll probably have to zoom out again at some point, but well, so yeah, uh, I described some of my recent life dynamics just to give you this sense of, uh, of lived complexity that I, I feel that is one thing that I'm experimenting with. And well, in this process of really focusing on, on, on the local interactions that I have with peers, 
uh, I've come to be connected to many networks which are quite interesting in the sense that these are networks of people who um, are really trying to, again, live complexity uh, not through a theory perspective but a practice perspective. And by doing so, they are really open to experimentations uh, in all dimensions. So even the way I've been uh, really housing myself for the past year relates to this. So I've been connected to houses where I can go to uh, and be more of a nomad as I like it to be. Uh, and the activities in terms of work have also been working like that in the sense that I can connect with people for projects uh, and then as soon as it self-organizes, it also you know, dismantles and then you have this, this, this movement coming together to other places. This is a rather difficult uh, dynamic to describe. I must say, every time I do it, I do it in a different way. But yesterday, talking to Anna, uh, she, well, she interpreted it in a beautiful way. She said, well, you're describing to me a force view, uh, or better yet, an empathy view. So the people who are connected with you in these networks, uh, there's some sort of empathy that brings you together and that allow you to live this way, in terms of work, in terms of living, in terms of resources in general. And one of the experimentations that happened in this uh, field space was uh, this, uh, uh, this philosophy sharing that is here. So what is this? This is a magazine in, in Malta. So I, long story why, but uh, the fact is that they invited me to write an article about philosophy to be printed and shared in this magazine. And by that time, I was really immersed into this force field and really um, try to understand it. And so I, I, I thought with myself, well, it might be a good idea to use this opportunity of writing an article to explore what it means to be uh, living like this with these people in this network. And this is a really well-distributed network, concentrated in Brazil, where I was born, but also uh, rather global. And so what did I do? Um, I, I came to this course field and I said, well, there's this fact. I was invited to write this article. Uh, can we do it uh, in a non-traditional way? Can, we, can we, we use the empathy or whatever it is that brings us together and co-write it or write it together? So that was an experiment that I run, well, I consider it to be an experiment, and it was quite fun. Like, the article was quite great, and many people came. I just opened a collaborative pad. There was no real control over what should be written or not. Uh, I did do the work of, like, synthesizing it and putting it together coherently, but most of the raw work was done by many hands. I don't even know how many people contributed on that, but well, in one week we had a thousand words and it was pretty well structured and pretty well put together. So that opened my eye to some things like, well, there's something here. Like the fact that this happened, there were no incentives laid out. There was no token that, you know, people would get tokens by heart, nothing like that. But it happened, it, 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 it came together, it emerged. And that opened my eye to something. So, when Josh invited me to come here, I thought with myself, well, this is another opportunity to experiment with this. I don't know what it is, but I'm tinkering with it. Uh, and I thought, well, so I have this opportunity to talk to all of these people. Well, you're here now talking. And then I was thinking, well, what am I going to talk about? Emergence as a concept in complexity fascinates me. So I thought with myself, well, Josh asked me, you need to give me a title of your talk. It's like, OK, it could be uh, co-creation and emergence. And then give me a description. I just wrote anything that is at least on the paper here. But my idea was opening the process of co-creation of this very talk in this course. Um, and that happened. And that's what I'm going to show you. That's what I'm going to present to you today and some of the consequences of that. Uh, so yeah, so the, just to go real quick. So the process begins. Uh, so how do I do it? Just a call out. I invite anyone connected to these networks to come and contribute. Uh, and we have one of the persons right in the back who contributed a lot. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, but yeah, it was just a call out. So whoever is there connected, if this makes any sense to you, I'm not laying any incentive structure whatsoever, but if this resonates with you, let's come and interact virtually through uh, Zoom. And just so you know, we're also recording this through Zoom. You're not on it, it's just the screen. But I think we have some people who also participated in this here, yes, <laughs> there they are. Uh, that's my mom right there, by the way. Uh, so maybe we can interact with them later, but just for the sake of time. Uh, we, we, we did a lot of these interactions. Uh, in total, four of them, uh, and it's been 
bit over 10 hours of conversations about uh, what emergence and what co-creation is. Um, and I must say that many other dynamics in this force field, they happen like that. So all of these people, uh, well, the very fact that my mom is now in another city it, it, it's a rep, sorry, is a representation of that. But then going to the process itself, which I think is what brought me here. That's what I want to share. Um, it was really interesting because, you know, we have all of this theory that tells us that in emergent processes, you don't have a lot of control over what's emerging or what's going to come out of it. And, well, the theory makes sense, but when I started the process for this talk, I kind of had an idea of what I wanted to tell you. And that, you know, it, 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 I came into the interactions with this sort of idea of control that I should bring the flow of conversation towards some directions. But then I soon rea realized that, well, no, I should just let it go and see what comes out of it in terms of content, in terms of ideas to, well, to present to you. And that in itself was quite interesting because I think for the first time, I realized that although I say I don't tend to control things, I do. Uh, and it's only when you experiment with that that you realize those things that are deep inside of you. And well, with that, emergence really began uh, in the process. As we start coming together and interacting, a lot of things become, a lot of things started to happen that I didn't uh, account for. So resources became available for me to be here. I'm talking about financial resources, social resources. Uh, and that was something I wasn't really expecting, but I opened myself to this force field for whatever wanted to come. So that happened. Uh, we had a first interaction um, on this platform, Zoom, and then I put it on, online, and after two days or so, one of the people connected to this network, they come to me and say, hey, I met that conversation. So I went on it, and I listened to it, and I got the main concepts that resonated with me, and I put them on a map. Uh, utilizing a tool called Kumo and that was really great because then that triggered me to well map all of the other interactions and make that the substrate of what I wanted to share with you and some I'm, I'm gonna show you that map real soon but uh, just some other things like some funny feelings started to emerge as this process developed in the sense that it really became something intrinsic of myself so in any conversation I would have with people, well, let's say in the frequency of this force field or not, I would end up talking about it, uh, even in ways I, I wasn't necessarily aware of it. And by, in, in that process, I, I came to concepts and ideas that really framed what I was doing so as to give me the, well, the cognitive tools to describe it to you right now. So, what I'm trying to say, I wasn't really sure about what I was doing when it began, but by the end of it, I kind of have a pretty good idea of what I was doing in terms of an ontology and an epistemology, and that came through the process. That wasn't there before it. But I'll, I'll hope, hopefully I will share that with you, and that will be more uh, clear. But let's get to the, to the real meat of it. Um, hopefully this will go through. Mm, okay. So, uh, yeah, so this is Kumo, uh, for those of you who don't know. It's a mapping tool, great. I recommend you go check it with K. Uh, so this was the mapping of the first interaction that this person did, and then they sent it to me. Each uh, node or each circle here represents a, a concept that we described in these uh, interactions. And as I said, that triggered me to do more of mapping. So. In the second interaction, I put the nodes there that I found relevant, and then I made the connections with the nodes in the second and the first interaction, and so on and so forth, until I got onto this map, uh, which is, I like to think about this as, um, as the collective brain, or, or at least part of a collective brain of these interactions. Um, and I see it as something that is very useful to any sort of co-creative process, uh, be that in an organization or not. In this case, it's not necessarily within the boundaries of an organization, uh, but it, it, it does uh, bring a lot, of, uh, a lot of the real stuff that we discussed in these interactions is, is embedded in this map. And the good thing about Como is that if you click on any of this, you have a little description of it. Some of them are still in Portuguese because most of the things we were doing were in Portuguese. And the connections themselves, 
also have descriptions that you can characterize. Some of, some of them are here. Uh, so this is the, let's say, the final result of, of all of these interactions that we had about co-creation and emergence. And by looking into it, I was thinking, well, how am I going to frame it so it makes any sense, so it is relevant to what, everything that we've been discussing here? Uh, and that's part of what I'm going to show you now. But for that, I think I'm going to use, well, it's already set, um, so I will use some sort of a timeline so as to describe how this process developed uh, over the interactions that we had. And I also must say that these interactions happen in the course of two months. So that's, uh, this experiment ran for two months, uh, if, you, if you think about it. So yeah, we started talking about complexity. There was no way around it. Uh, but it was uh, rather interesting because we didn't talk about complexity in the common terms that we usually refer to uh, from academia, uh, but again, rather through lead complexity. Although we did have a professor who have, has been studying complexity for 20 years in Brazil, who came to all of the interactions and, and brought a lot of theoretical background to it. But it was really nice to understand how people thought about it in terms of their own interactions in these networks. Uh, I think it really gives another layer to the, to the idea or to the phenomena of, of complexity, which is not necessarily one that is detached from the system un under study. It's a rather first-person perspective into it, and I find it very rich. Uh, and from there, we went on to talk about system thinking and complex thinking, which it was the first time that I thought them, I, I saw them as two separate things. Uh, so one, well, this professor that I met, uh, I think he's here, Julio, if you're there. Um, I think he was one of the first persons who, first people to introduce me to these things as distinct uh, in the sense that they have really different ontology and histories of themselves. And that was really fascinating to me because up until that moment, I had been studying complexity through the systems lenses. Uh, which is, well, rather valuable, but it, I realized it, it, it did not encompass all of my experience with complexity through a lead complexity perspective, as I try to describe. And let me tell you why. Oh yeah, this is just the, the branching of this. So systems thinking, well, led us to talk about systems, of course, uh, and complex thinking led us to talk about complex biological processes, which is a process uh, understanding of complexity, not a systems understanding of complexity. And there are some fundamental differences. Uh, I see some people like about, like that uh, in the back. There's some fundamental differences about it. And yeah, uh, I'll tell you what they are. So the systems approach to understanding complexity. Um, I don't want to fall into the trap of generalize uh, this to all of the system practices, especially here, well, since, since we have so many system practitioners. But overall, the system, the, the, the model of a system, uh, it is uh, defined by some of these um, characteristics. So yes, usually we talk about systems, they will have some sort of membrane, some sort of boundary, even if it's dynamic, that will be something that you can distinguish a system from another one. Uh, well, especially in the cybernetics or sometimes in the engineering, I really like what you said there, you have rules of relating for the elements of the system. And those rules, sometimes they, they don't make sense and they would not be correspondent, because, especially in social systems. Well, people are just diverse, they're just people. So you cannot do that. So that's one of the other limitations of a systems approach to, to understanding complexity. This uh, formative teleology uh, is the idea that once a system is set and these rules are defined, as it runs over time, its, it's, it's end, teleology, is, it's about its final state, that's kind of like set in course already. Uh, and that's very true, for instance, for blockchain systems. Uh, some of them are really like that. And, well, we know for a fact that the experience of complexity goes beyond that. So that's one of the things that we discussed. Uh, and yeah, system has something that is outside its internal interactions. So a lot of the time, especially in the design realm, we see people, we see people talking about systems and they'll be like, oh, the system has to be like this or like that. But it doesn't even look like they are inserted in the system. But that's a, that's a mal, malfunctional, malfunctional approach, especially towards design. 
So that's, that can be another limitation to the systems approach to understanding complexity. And we, we went deep on this, uh, reading some authors, discussing some other ideas about um, what this meant, and especially in the context of a systems innovation conference. So this is what I'm bringing, is just the summary of it. But it was really fundamental to what's coming next, which is kind of like the result or one of the results of this process. But before we go into that, uh, just to talk a little bit about the process approach to understanding complexity. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's complexity through the, through the local interactions. So again, uh, a little bit of what, what I described in terms of what my experience of complexity has been. Uh, and it doesn't, it doesn't try, this approach doesn't try to bound systems, it doesn't try to create main brains, but rather understand the flows that, well, just flow uh, either through one system or another. Uh, and then there's this idea of transformative teleology, which is the fact that you cannot predict what the end of, a, of the dynamic of a system will be uh, if it's really complex, if, if, it, if its complexity is not bounded. Uh, and, and this is all very true for me, just for the, well, the dynamics I have been having in my life, uh, as I described before. And then we went on to read this guy. Uh, I think Professor Julie will be very proud of this slide now. Uh, Hall of Stacey, he's a professor, uh, I always forget where he teaches, but it's a university in the UK, uh, and he teaches management. And he talks about, uh, well, yeah, complexity, uh, not through the systems approach, but through the approach of the local interactions. And here he's talking about organizations, I would uh, change this for organisms in general. And well, this force field I described, I sometimes refer to it as an organism. And he talks and he says that, uh, yeah, organizations are not systems, but the ongoing patterning of interactions between people. And these patterns of human interaction, they produce further patterns of human interaction. And yeah, not this idea of something outside that you can then steer and control, uh, which is usually the approach taken uh, under the systemic view of systems uh, when people don't even put themselves onto the system. And then this uh, perspective that he brings, he calls complex responsive processes of relating. And there's, well, an entire literature on it. He has four books on it. It's quite interesting. I'm actually diving into it myself right now. I, I'm not an expert whatsoever. Uh, and well, this relates a lot to uh, this idea of fluxus or fluxus, which is uh, in this force field that I described to you, which involves many different networks, um, there is really, there's really a flow of flows that permeate them, uh, which again, have brought me here financially speaking, but have also uh, allowed me to live a very free and nomadic life for the past year or two. Uh, and this idea of complex dialogical process, it really resonated with that, which was something that uh, other, other clusters of these organisms brought. So this is the coming together of theory and observation in practice. I just wanted to put it there. Um, so yeah, while, while we were talking about complexity and all that, um, I started to notice something in the process of the interactions that we were having. Um, so it, in terms of ideas coming together in these very interactions, right? In terms of ideas coming together, in terms of uh, concepts being created, there was an underlying pattern that I started to observe. And this underlying, underlying pattern is, uh, is characterized by these uh, four nodes, so just the uh, futuring of the map. And what are these? So as we were, well, co-creating this very own talk, I came to understand, or at, le at least that was my perception, that co-creation or emergence would happen in this experiment when, this, when, when the interactions between the nodes were happening as, uh, as these elements, uh, or as I better put here, when these elements come together as the very interaction between the nodes, they catalyze emergent phenomena and, and co-creation. So what are these elements? And this will be clear in a bit, so <laughs> hang on with me. So these elements are the micro relationships or the micro dialogues happening between these nodes. Not only in the interactions that we were having uh, on these uh, conference sessions, but also 
widespread as these nodes would meet each other individually and so on and so forth. So that, that was something that was very present in anything that emerged out of this process. Together with, with improvisation in the sense that, well, when these nodes would come together locally, not through a macro perspective, they would really start, they would really enter a process of improvisation. And here we describe improvisation as, um, improvisation as creation manifestation. So coming together, these nodes would interact in a way that was not simply what we usually do as in, hey, how are you doing? No, it was really, there would be an improvisation, a, a, a gameplay between these nodes, uh, which needed presence of both nodes. So in all of these interactions that I'm describing, these patterns were present. Uh, and so by, by the nodes being present and improvising in these micro interactions, in these local distributed interactions, it almost felt like, and this is not just me saying, this is something that came in in these other interactions, it almost felt like they would enter Kairos. Oh, I didn't translate this, but no problem. Kairos is, uh, anybody familiar with it? No? So the Greek had two ideas for time, Kronos and Kairos. Kronos is the chronological time, is the time we count on a clock. Kairos is the time you spend with your child. Kairos is the time you spend with the person you love. It's the time that is non-linear. It's when five minutes felt like an hour and vice versa. So when these elements, these three elements came together as patterns of interactions between these nodes in this force field, it's almost like they entered Kairos. And by doing so, what happened is that they found, ah, by doing so, what happened is that they would find themselves in a space where co-creation and emergence was, it's the potential for co-creation and emergence was higher. Uh, and this was something that I felt, it was intuitive to me throughout these interactions. And I didn't even know how to think about it. I had no frames or reference to conceptualize it. And that's one of the reasons why I'm struggling to describe it to you. But I did have some hypotheses about it. So one of them is, well, yeah, when these elements come together as the very interaction between nodes in open networks, again, I'm not talking about systems, then they catalyze co-creation, co-creative and emergent phenomena. And my sub-hypothesis was that, well, whatever comes out of this, whatever emerges out of this is rather ephemeral. It, it's not something that's, that is solid, that is, that is something that will be there for a long period of time. It is something that comes like this very talk. It's, it's, it emerged and then you, you will probably disperse, but it does leave traces behind. Just like the process uh, we see uh, with, with, with distributed, um, I think we can call it distributed networks of, of maybe insects, uh, uh, where, where you have the emergence of a colony, which is just made by the traces left behind in the local interactions of the, of the agents. So that was very confusing to me, it still is, but I did find something that really helped me to think about it. And it was the emergent ontology and epistemology of this very process. So remember I said some funny things happened once I started this process. I started to have conversations with people that refer me back to it. I started reading things that refer me back to it. And then in one of these funny things, I came across an article, uh, an article by David Pines is a co-founder in residence of Santa Fe Institute. I think we are all familiar with Santa Fe. And he introduced me to this idea of gateways to emergent behavior. Um, and in the article, uh, which is very interesting, he talks about some of the original ideas behind Santa Fe, which I think now has 60 years or something like that. So, no bit less, 40 or so. So he says that one of the initial drives behind Santa Fe was to investigate exactly this, like what are the gateways to emergent behavior that we see around us all the time, both in nature, both in social systems. <laughs> uh, but that's one of the things that they wanted to investigate. And then he describes or he gives tips to the ontological and epistemological approaches to find such or set gateways. And I'm gonna quote him full because I think it's really good. So he says, 
What replaces the reductionist path to understanding emergent behavior in the physical, biological, and social sciences? The short answer is a new starting point. Recognizing that understanding emergent behavior requires focus on the emergent collective properties that characterize the system. I'm not studying a system, but well, <laughs> just to make that clear, the system as a whole and a search for their orange. It means identifying emergent collective patterns and regularities through experiment or observation and then devising models that embody candidate collective organizing concepts and principles that might explain them. These patterns, principles, and models are the gateways to emergent behavior observed in the system under study. Only through studying these gateways can we hope to grasp emergent behaviors on a grand unifying scale. It's deep, it's long, it is Santa Fe. But this idea of organizing concepts, concepts and principles really show me what I was looking at. Uh, so, yeah. So then I, well, maybe I have found such gateway. Uh, this should not be in plural, but. And my reflection was that given the key role, yeah, of local interactions on self-organization and emergence, we cannot, well, I think we can hope, but I don't think we can realistically find one grand unifying framework for emergence. But what we can do is to search for set gateways to emergent behavior, or I like to call it emergent phenomena, in a specific context. And again, that's why I think what I did was an experiment, uh, which on and up and off itself will shed light into what's behind the grand scheme of things. It's because of fractals, right? Well, if, and then we can go as deep as we want onto that. But the fact is that by observing specific contexts and understanding how emergent behavior happens there, it doesn't give us all of the answers to everything related to emergence in the outer world, but it does give us, well, maybe some tips on to how it happens uh, in these other scales. But back to, um, yeah, this, uh, what he also suggests in what well, David Pine, was, what, what he also suggests uh, in his article is that we should do this, identify emergent collective patterns and regularities to experiment or observation. And again, I do think I ran an experiment, or we did for the, for the matter being. Uh, and the experiment whose result is this very talk that I'm giving to you right now. And yeah, the <laughs> creation of the stock stands as one of such experiments. And I don't think this is limited to, well, just my life. I think this can be done anywhere, within or without a system uh, for the sake being. Yeah, and again, I was not studying a specific system. Uh, I was rather, again, tinkering uh, with, with open networks or force fields or empathy fields, as uh, Anna called them yesterday, uh, which are quite different in their, in their nature. Uh, what did I write here? Yeah, well, this is what David Pine says on, on, on his article, that, well, we should recognize this emergency to recognize this emergent behavior, we need to focus on the emergent collective pro properties that characterize the system as a whole and a search for the origin. Um, and then, as I kept on reading, more of said emergent epistemology came to me, or in other words, more frameworks that helped me to really reflect and understand everything that was happening in this process. And this again, Hoff Stacy, so the guy I quoted before, and he says, He's describing here what his PhD students do for their PhD. And that's what he says. Organizations and, well, organisms for me, have to be understood in terms of one's own personal experience of participating with others in the co-creation of the patterns of interactions that are the organization. And again, he says that patterns of interactions don't give rise to systems. It only give rise to more patterns of interaction. So the students research in his PhD program is therefore their narration of current events they are involved in together with their reflection on themes of particular importance emerging in the stories of their own experience of participating, of participation with others to create the patterns of interactions that are the organization. What they actually do is going into companies, that's what they do, uh, it's a management uh, degree, and in these companies they try to, well, be present in the local interactions there 
and from there, catalyze emergence and not bring a whole set of tools for systemic change. Uh, so it's a, a different approach. And then we come back to this. Um, to me, these are the underlying principle, organizing principles and concepts present in this process that I'm describing to you, which give rise to or which characterize a gateway to emergent behavior. And that's why I call it gateway one. <laughs> uh, and what emerged out of that? Well, this, uh, us talking here. Um, and that's how it expands with the second degree of connection. So these principles and organizing concepts, well, they, they expand onto these other ones. And again, I would need a lot of time to talk about any one of these because we had really deep conversations about each of them. So I'm just giving you an overview. And back to David Pine, he suggests um, that ident well, identify emerging collective patterns and regularities to experiment of or observation. That's what I believe I did in this process. And then devising models that embody candidate collective organizing concepts and principles that might explain them. And then the idea of models really stuck to me because last year I took a MOOC on agent-based modeling, but I had never devised a model. So I thought with myself, well, this might be a good experience for me, good opportunity for me to experiment with that. And yeah, uh, agent-based modeling. And do you remember the funny things that happened in this process? Well, when I was starting to build this model, I was put in touch with somebody, with a friend of a friend, whose PhD was on agent-based modeling. And talking uh, with him about what I, want, what I was doing, he told me something that I found brilliant. Uh, that is, when it comes to agent-based modeling, it's not that the world behaves like the model, but rather the model functions to demonstrate the plausibility that the world behaves like that, or that part of the world behaves like that. And that really got me into thinking that, well, I should really try to get this, um, this uh, organizing principles and concepts that I believe are behind this emergent gateway and bring them into a model. Not to say that all emergent behavior will happen like that, but rather to show the plausibility uh, that, well, this model can really explain what happened in this entire process that I'm describing to you. And so I'm gonna show you the model, but before that, I just wanna acknowledge all of the people that came into this interaction. So here in the map, I just highlighted their names. I wish I had had time to put their pictures here. I, well, couldn't do it, but they're all here. Um, and thank you if any of you is there. And now, um, to the model. Um, that's, uh, that's the final bit of uh, my time. And yeah, I have 10 minutes, so that should be good enough. So what did I do here? Um, okay, so I started off by Again, all of these that I'm describing to you happen in the context of networks, right? So I started off by creating a simple model of networks. And for that, I used the preferential attachment network by Barabat, Barabat, yeah, Barabat, uh, and yeah, I didn't bother about how I was gonna view the network. I just used that from that logo. And I'm using this uh, modeling uh, uh, framework, that logo, and on top of that, uh, I created nodes. So these are little persons, as you can see. And I gave each one of them uh, something that I call a co-creation potential. So what is this? So within this force field that I'm describing to you, uh, what usually happens is that once somebody has an idea and they want to materialize it, um, they come and reach out to others. So I thought about, okay, so how can I frame this feeling of having an idea, and this idea being uh, developed enough so you would share with others and try to bring it together. To bring it to my own example, I had this idea of opening up the process of co-creating this talk. Uh, so I had uh, what I call here a high co-creation potential in the sense that I was willing and, uh, and yeah, I, I was willing to go and share the idea with others and see what they, uh, how they would get back to me or not uh, based on that. So that's one thing agents have. And then, well, that's actually the only thing that they have here. And then the connections between agents uh, represent the quality of this connection between them. So you might have friends, 
whose connections with are really strong, so just because of previous interactions with, the, with said friends, and others whose connections are not so strong. And the same applies here. And, and that's, uh, that's uh, well uh, demonstrated here by the, by the thickness of the connections. So that's the initial conditions. And when I hit setup, uh, what the model does is just to, well, initiate the world with as many elements as I want, as many agents as I want, and give them ra random uh, co-creative potential from one to 10 and also give them random, their, their connections random quality. So that's how the world starts. And then we have four things that we can play here with. Uh, and I made this sort of matrix to explain them. Uh, and this role concerns whatever relates to the individual agents. So the way the model works or the way I designed it is that an agent, once, once him or her has this co-creative potential that is higher than an ignition threshold that we can set here, he will interact with his nodes. So he will, he will run a function that, will, that means interaction with these nodes. Um, so here we regulate this, um, this ignition threshold, but in, interaction with, in interacting with his nodes, there is a chance that his interaction will be well uh, receive or not and that's this frequency that we have here and these are global properties of the entire uh, simulation and this here concerns the link the links between agents so once a node has this co-creative potential which is higher than the threshold he will uh, interact with all of his neighbors connected to him and the what will determine if his neighbors will help him with his idea or not, or what will determine if the people will come and join me in, in video conference sessions to, well, do whatever it is or not, is this quality threshold. So remember that each connection has its own quality, so we determine a threshold, and if the quality is higher than that, then this node will have the support of, uh, of the nodes uh, of, of his neighbors. But in each of these interactions, there are also mismatches. Uh, and this relates to, you know, in the real world, uh, well, this is a simulation of some real world situations. Uh, the person will not see their phone or they will have a headache or whatever it is, there will be a mismatch and they will not come back to you. So there's this mismatch uh, frequency. So that's sort of like the model that I built. Those concepts I showed you that came into the, the mapping so the, the, the underlying concepts between the gateway that I think I've identified, they are, at least to my understanding, they are behind the code of this. And thank you, Samara, uh, my partner, for having helped me to devise, devise this code. Um, and then these are the things we can play with or tinker with. And well, what, what does it do? It's just a picture. No, it got uh, stuff. Oh, and yeah, just to describe how an agent-based model works, given these conditions, we hit go and then it iterates over, well, whatever many iterations we want and that kind of like simulates time. So how does this one work? With these conditions, if we hit go, uh, and I hope my computer will not be too slow, these happens. So what is that? What, what am I trying to simulate here? Um, is the opening and closing of emerging gateway. So what does it mean? This node, for instance, which is a green one, he has this, well, force field or whatever it is that is expanding around him uh, that represents how his co-creative potential is giving rise or not to something, how it's being materialized into something or not. So in interacting with his nodes, if there's any feedback from said nodes, which I call momentum in this model, his force field will be greater. So in a sense, he will have more of his neighbors or more of his peers' attentions, attention resources or what, whatever it is to actualize his idea or his co-creative potential. And this expands and retracts according to the, to, well, the things we can play with around here. Uh, and so let's play with it to see how it differs. If we reset and then it just uh, brings the network to the beginning how it was, 
we can see that the, the model has sort of logic to it in the sense that if we if with the same network we increase the mismatch frequency so uh, let's say uh, yeah people are just busy and I felt that for instance in the elections in Brazil which were just happening recently nobody would like reply anything if it was not politically related so there was a higher mismatch frequency to me if you increase that with the same conditions for the other ones well not much will happen uh, because yeah people might relate to others ideas people might understand what they mean they might have good quality relationships but they would just be busy with something else they will not be able to come and support their peers so as for this peer, for sad peers to uh, bring forth whatever vision they had so well that shows one part of the model if we for instance increase the affinity frequency meaning that this is more related to an overall alignment between send nodes which means that they are more likely to like each other's idea over time uh, then it should be the case that we have much more of said uh, gateways opening uh, for for the network and yeah my mo my computer is a bit slow now so we can't really see the differences here but momentum gives us a really good uh, just in the density of it so we have much more momentum in the first iteration that we ran the second one with the mismatch not so much and here as it is more dense it's because of the affinity frequency um and well we can play with many other of these things and if we do things like well changing the ignition and the quality down not much or rather you will have a more widespread uh you have more widespread creation happening across the model just because then it's not only the high quality uh connections that really happen and it's not only the people with high co-creative potential that have their calls answered so you have a more democratic uh, instance in, in the whole simulation and so on and so forth. Uh, the idea here is that you can play with it and it might be a bit, um, well, unrealistic set model because again, it was built for a very specific context, but I think that it, ho it, it stands as a byproduct of a process of investigation, of tinkering, which can be really replicated in very different contexts, including, I guess, bounded systems. And the fact being that this has some sort of legitimacy, again, not, as, not to describe how the entire world works, but to give a possibility of how it works, to the very own, well, open network or force field of people that have come to this process. And one of the very exciting things right now, and one of the reasons why my mom is here is that these people are gathering together to develop a, well, blockchain base or whatever it is, technology that will assist all of these uh, interactions that are happening within this force field. Uh, and this model is probably be a, one of the backbones of this technological uh, forthcoming. Uh, and yeah, it resonates deeply with all of these people. And I think it brought a lot of clarity into their own processes uh, when coming together as a network, again, not through the lenses or framework of organizations or institutions, uh, but networks of people who can really bring life into many different things, uh, who can really create value and gather value uh, that is, well, distributed across, again, open networks. Again, the, the whole talk of the values that we, not, we don't use because we don't know how to access them. And to me, these, uh, this entire experiment, this entire experience, stands as a process through which, um, or at least I could identify what are the gateways to emergence in this uh, field that I've been exploring. And yeah, it, uh, it, it, it makes a lot of sense. And uh, it, will, it will be, again, one of the, on the underlying pillars of a, of a technology to assist uh, more and more of these uh, co-creative endeavors in this uh, open network or in this uh, force field. And just to bring it to an end, 
um, I like to get back to the beginning of it when I said, well, I wasn't really sure about what I was doing in terms of this experiment and how it would relate or not to the overall theme of this, uh, of this conference. But now coming here and seeing that the idea of, uh, of systems is also something that is being uh, reflected in, well, this in larger community, I understand that what I did was um, perhaps one little experiment towards an understanding of complexity that really goes beyond the systems paradigm. And for me, that's a realm we really have no idea about. And it's a realm that it's really open there to be explored. And I like to think about of this experiment as one very small tinkering in that direction uh, that could shed light into other, shed light to other processes uh, with similar uh, inquiries to understand what, yeah, what it means to understand and to leave complexity uh, unbounded by any sort of membrane. Um, yeah, that's kind of like where I wanted to get. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, questions, yeah. You, you asked at the beginning if uh, anything resonated, so I just want to share my resonance. Um, I've actually done a hobby, music all my life, and I've had when I was a kid. And actually, part of this, what we were describing, very aptly describes the song creation process oh. with a band <laughs> and improvisation with a band. And also that you can actually, you know, add more actors to it as you, you know, lower the politics rate. Yes. <laughs> um, and it is really like that, you know, the, the higher the quality, the less people we have to have in the writing process. Right. And, but, but the actual, you know, like emergence from like collective write, writing process is very well described. Nice, I'm, I'm glad, I'm um, glad to hear that. So actually, I wanna, I'll rip off that briefly and say, completely separate context, so I, I played and coached ultimate frisbee for a long time, very competitively. And what you end up doing in sports is you have to be in flow to play sports. Like you can't analyze or like plan or really strategize when you're on the field. But then, of course, the behavior itself, playing, is an emergent phenomenon from your team. But you impose some structure and some training, and you do a lot outside of the context of the game to try to condition your self and your teammates and everything to, to sort of, I mean, I'm going to say sort of like you first co-create the order of your, of your team sort of strategy. It's not a professional sport, it's a club. So you're co-creating your strategy, you're co-creating the actual play when you're on the field and you're doing it in flow. And what I was thinking about early on and you triggered for me was this part where you have to basically um, separate the part that's planned or engineered or processed, like when you choose who to invite to your, your, your music writing process or whatever, from the, the part that actually is in flow. And so in most co-creation processes, both the sort of effort to structure and pose something and the releasing that and allowing what to happen to happen occurs, at least in my experience, is in every co-creation process from academic paper writing to, to real projects to like sports. Mm. Like that your music analogy made me think that like, I don't know, it's like it triggered my thinking like, oh, well, this is just like from here to there to everything else I can think of, you have to deal with both. Mm. And then, I have just a question for your your experience going through this, what frustrated you? Like, were there, what, what frustrated you? Oh, what frustrated Were there points where you wanted when you were going through that? Oh, and God, yeah. didn't, are there like dark patterns that didn't emerge? <laughs> right. Um, so I think I was, at some point, I was expecting that, yeah, uh, maybe I was too ambitious with it, but I was expecting that we would get at something more, um, uh, something really uh, essential to to all emerging phenomena. And I think we did to a certain extent, like well, at least what you're describing, 
this might be present in what music and sports are. I think maybe that's something we reached, but um, it 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 wasn't it wasn't something that we did deep enough. So it becomes a new theory appended to you know the whole complexity science. I think I, I came into this a little bit with that kind of like a mindset. At some point, it was a bit of a frustration, but then I just realized what I was doing, uh, which had nothing to do with that. I was actually looking at a specific context. Um, and then I was like, oh no, yeah, this is a just completely different approach. Again, a different epistemological and logical approach. So it makes complete sense, so I'm okay with it. Like I don't need to, uh, yeah, I don't need to append anything onto the, uh, the complexity uh, theory or, or framework that is out there. Uh, I think that was one thing. Um, and maybe, it's, well, in the interactions themselves, uh, as we were, like some of these were really long, like we were chatting for three, four hours. We would really deviate and bringing you back to the, well, the main theme was something that would come to my mind and I would, I would realize, well, no, let it go. Uh, so I really tried my best not to impose any structure to the process. Uh, and that was cool because we ended up talking about jazz. We ended up talking about a whole bunch of different things that I didn't expect. But at some point, I felt frustrated for not having too much coherence uh, in the in the interactions that we were like, 